Welcome back scholars. This video will be on net ionic equations. And so there's a few concepts to talk about here before we really get into the meat of the video. One of those concepts is of spectator ions. And so just like spectators with sports, if you are sitting on the side observing what's going on, but you are not participating in the athletic event, if you are not participating in the chemical reaction, then you are called a spectator. And what I've asked you to do to identify spectator ions in these reactions is to use a little squiggly line. And you'll know if something is a spectator ion because like the barium, it will be present in the exact same state with the exact same charge and the exact same number of oxygens if it's not being changed. And if it's not being changed, then that makes it a spectator ion. So the barium is a spectator ion in this first reaction. What other ion do you see in exactly the same state on both sides? The nitrate. Both nitrates are spectator ions. The other thing I've asked you to circle in each of these reactions is the driving force. What, be, what is it that's being formed that drives the reaction? And there's three choices. There's formation of a precipitate, formation of a gas, or formation of water. And so the water here is the driving force for this reaction. When we write the net ionic equation, just as if you wanted a net weight or a net mass, you're only going to show the difference between the two sides. What is it that's changing? And the things that are changing are the protons and the hydroxides. They are reacting. They are coming together to form water. Since the formation of water is the driving force for this reaction, we'd better see the presence of that product in our net ionic equation. This is the process that drives this whole reaction forward. The other thing to notice here is that all of our coefficients can be reduced. They are all divisible by two, and our net ionic equation should always have reduced coefficients. So for your final answer, you would want to cancel out or reduce all of those coefficients on those protons, hydroxides, and waters. So really for net ionic equations, the concepts really are that ions or chemical species that do not change are then called spectators or spectator ions. For them to not change, they not only have to have the same element the same charge and the same state, um, but they would, all, would also have to have the same number of oxygens if they started off with any oxygens. For instance, if permanganate changes into manganese, that is no longer a spectator because the number of oxygens has changed. The net ionic equation only shows us what's changing in the reaction. It does not show any of these spectator ions that are still floating around in solution. But notice that the protons had to come from somewhere and the hydroxides had to come from somewhere. And so that's really the purpose these spectator ions serve in solution is that they were there to balance out the charge of the protons and to balance out the charge of the hydroxides initially in the beginning of the reaction. The rest of this video is just going to go over the question from the prior video. I'm going to go through and explain what the answers should be for all of these other reactions. 
So if you want to check your work on those, you should continue to watch. Otherwise, this is all the information you really need for the net ionic equations. Of course, the whole process overall is that you would have to start by writing the molecular equation. Then you identify in the molecular equation what kinds of electrolytes those species are. And for things that are non-electrolytes, like water, you do not dissociate them into ions. So anything that is a gas, liquid, or a solid stays together in the total ionic equation. You do not break it apart. Then in the total ionic equation, only those things that are aqueous could break apart and only if they are strong electrolytes. And in that total ionic equation, there are bound to be a few ions that are unchanged those are called spectator ions. And the driving force for that reaction has to be included as a product in the net ionic equation. And the net ionic equation only shows us the things that change. So without going all the way to show you spectators and to show you the net ionic equations on these other reactions, let's go ahead and explain what our answers would be for them. And there's really kind of two ways that you could approach these. So the first way would be the traditional way of looking at your reactants and swapping your ions, remembering to balance your charges. And then considering solubility rules, we know that all group one metal salts like sodium are soluble. We know that almost all halide salts are soluble. So sodium iodide is soluble. Soluble means it can dissolve. Can dissolve means that it can form a solution in water. In other words, it is aqueous. The barium sulfate, we know that most sulfates are soluble. However, sulfates have exceptions and heavy group two metals like barium are one of those exceptions. So the barium sulfate is insoluble, which means it cannot dissolve, which means if it's formed as a product, it's actually going to fall out of the solution as a precipitate. Now we know that this is insoluble. Insoluble means weak electrolyte. Insoluble salt, rather, I should say, means weak electrolyte. whereas the soluble salt is a strong electrolyte. So in our products, we're going to keep the barium sulfate together, but all of these others are going to split up into their component ions. So the total ionic equation, you can abbreviate a little bit if you like, is going to be barium ions, in solution with two iodide ions in solution with two sodium ions in solution with a sulfate ion in solution. And I know I'm running out of space here, so I'm gonna draw an arrow down here for the products side of this reaction. And the products are going to be two sodium ions in solution plus two iodide ions in solution, plus barium sulfate is a solid, only aqueous things could split up and only if they are strong electrolytes. So this barium sulfate is a solid, we're going to keep it together. Even though it does partially ionize, the majority of it is going to stay together as barium sulfate. So that's what you should have from Friday for your total ionic equation for this reaction. Now the other way to kind of think about these or approach these is to split all of your ions up in the beginning because this is really how they are going to be existing in solution. And our total ionic equation for our reactants, we're gonna have two protons 
in solution and a sulfate ion in solution and two lithium ions in solution and a sulfide ion in solution. And then for their products up here, you could think about what other combinations could you make with these ions. And in reality, this would be especially true if you have more than two ionic compounds in a solution, there are many possibilities for what reactions could occur. We will fo focus down and try to write one specific chemical reaction at a time, but that doesn't mean that there can't be more than one thing happening in that solution. Now, out of these combinations of ions, we've already put hydrogens with sulfates. We can't put hydrogens with lithium because they're the same charge. What are they going to do to each other? They're going to repel each other. But we could put the hydrogens with the sulfide. So if we make H2S, then you should recognize that that is one of the gases we could form. Now, that is a possibility for a gas that can form. And then the lithium can go with a sulfate. Most sulfates are soluble. Group one metal salts are soluble. So we've got two reasons to keep this lithium sulfate as an aqueous compound. And there should be two lithiums there to balance out the two minus charge on the sulfate. So the H2S is a gas because you might recognize that as a possible molecule that could actually form an acid and that could form an acid, but it's not one of our strong acids, that's going to make it a weak acid or a non-electrolyte. Or at best, if it's in solution, and we're saying it's a gas, so it's not in solution, at best in solution, it might be a weak electrolyte. But the key is that both non-electrolytes and weak electrolytes we're going to keep together and not dissociate. So that H2S has to stay together. It would have to stay as a gas in the products. The lithium sulfate though is soluble. That's a soluble salt. So that would be a strong electrolyte. And we would still have two lithium ions and a sulfate ion in solution. Now the last one is gonna look a little bit different. Notice that all of these other reactions so far, not only have all of our reactants been aqueous, but they have all been strong electrolytes. This reaction, as I gave you a hint on Friday, this compound is a weak acid, it is a weak electrolyte, and so it's going to stay together. So this is going to be a little bit different in how it appears compared to the other reactions. The H on this CH3COO, this H is the acidic H. This H is the part that swaps with this sodium. So we're going to form water because this H is going to go with the OH. And this sodium is going to take the place of that H but really what that does is that makes this into Na and CH3COO minus, which is another way of showing the acetate ion. Acetate salts and sodium salts are soluble and so this whole thing is aqueous. Of course, water is a liquid. So this water is a non-electrolyte. We're gonna keep that together in solution. And the sodium acetate is a strong electrolyte. So we have a little bit of a change here, which is interesting. We've gone from a weak acid, a weak electrolyte, by reacting it with a strong electrolyte, we have turned it into a strong electrolyte. But notice we've also made water. Um, the sodium hydroxide, since that is a strong electrolyte, we would have sodium ions in solution 
and hydroxide ions in the solution. The water, since that is a non-electrolyte, would stay together. And the sodium acetate, as a strong electrolyte, would completely ionize into sodium ions in solution and acetate ion in solution. So again, you want to go back. You want to look at these other three reactions now. You want to attempt to identify and the spectator ions. You want to identify and name, write it out as a statement, what the driving force was. So the driving force for this reaction was the formation of water. Don't just say water, don't just name the product. It's the formation of that product that is the driving force for the reaction. And then make sure that you eliminate your spectator ions and make sure that your net ionic equation always shows the driving force that's actually there. So I'll scroll up again and I'll leave these here. You can pause on any one of these if you need more time to be able to write it down. And I look forward to seeing your comments in the discussion. Please remember um, that you should be submitting now the final version of this worksheet on Tuesday, oh, I'm sorry, Wednesday of this week. Um, good luck with your AP Human Geography exams tomorrow, Tuesday, May 12th.